invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 is our text. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 974, that's 974, and you will find Matthew chapter 13 and be able to follow along in our text. Uh, it's a very short text, but you'll be able to follow along. Now, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, or if you're at one of our other campuses at McCulloch or at Parker and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then uh, take one of those that's available. At McCulloch, it's the Bibles in the seats. Uh, at Parker, there's a table with Bibles on it in the back. Grab one of those, and we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Uh, Hey, while you're finding Matthew 13, I just got to tell you, uh, this is an exciting time of the year for service. You know, a week ago we finished Serve Our Schools. Well, I say finished it. We got most of the projects done a week ago. Some of you are working all week long to finish up those projects, and I, I thank God for that. And then we're moving into Main Street candy season. And I know uh, Pastor Mitch already shared about that, but this is an opportunity for us to bless the community in a way that, uh, uh, you know, it's not real preachy to be dressed up in costumes and play with kids and give them candy but it demonstrates the love of Christ in a powerful way. So if this is something new for you, uh, just go along with this and come check it out and see if you can volunteer. Uh, it is a great way to spend Halloween. I'm just telling you, uh, it, it is an awesome experience. And so I hope and pray your life group volunteers and you guys go down and serve together. People have been doing that for a decade or more and loving it. And uh, if not, if you're like, I don't have a life group, but it sounds fun, just sign up. Go online, calvarylhd.com, calvaryaz.com, and, and you can sign up and be a part of that. Hey, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I like to find what I'm looking for. You guys like to find what you're looking for? Yeah. I mean, it might be your glasses, it might be your keys, it might be your shoes, right? I think I spent about 40% of my childhood looking for my mom's keys. You know, they, she never knew where they were. We were always, she was like, and she had to leave like five minutes ago. And she's like, find my keys. Where? And, uh, and I never could understand how she could lose them. Uh, and then I knew other people, and I get that. Uh, people lose their keys all the time. Uh, or maybe you like finding a bargain, the deal, right? That special value. Or maybe you like finding that special someone. Uh, I keep waiting to find a winning lottery ticket that's been mailed in an envelope to Calvary anonymously. <laughs> I'm, I'll just keep waiting for that. Anyway, but seriously, uh, one of the things I love finding are people and their stories of how Jesus has changed their life. I love stories of life change. That's why, you know, I kind of make that offer all the time. And some of you take me up on it. Like, you know, I'd love to buy you lunch uh, or breakfast and hear your story of how God changed your life. Uh, that to me is exciting. That's one of the things I love to find. So, so what do you love to find? Uh, I know that's a dangerous question because we're moving into yard sale swap meet season. <laughs> right? Who loves the yard sale? I go to the swap meet. Let's see your hands. Go ahead and confess. We're in church. Some of you are like, I go to church on Saturdays so I can swap meet on Sundays. Uh, I don't care. Uh, I, I confess that I loathe yard sale sales. I mean, I'm not really against them. You guys can have them. I just don't want to stop at them, okay? That, that's me. But, but my wife, Merelda, loves the idea of uh, yard sales, but she doesn't like that most yard sales start like crazy early. Last time we did a yard sale, there were people who were like camping out in the driveway at like 4 a.m. I'm like, why are you there? It's all junk, and, uh, and, and Merle doesn't let me be at the yard sale when we have one because I just want to give it all away because I don't want to have to pack it up. Uh, but uh, so I'm not that guy. But uh, so she doesn't like getting up early in the morning. But then she found Havasu online yard sale. Some of you know about that, don't you? It is of the devil. Okay, <laughs> I'm just telling you. Uh, she's, she's like, I, look what I found. I found this. Now she finds all these deals and I can't really complain because it's on grandkids stuff. And our grandkids love the stuff that she finds. Uh, so she just is really, really good at finding it. So uh, today we're continuing the Moral of the Story series. And uh, we kicked it off last week talking about stories that Jesus tells that have an amazing point, uh, moral, if you will. And, and today we're looking at two very, very, very short parables 
found in Matthew 13. In fact, we're looking at two of them because each one of them is one verse long. One whole verse long. Matthew 13, verses 44 and 45. And uh, so, you know, if you're like, I'm looking for the text, this is the text, this is it. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Uh, Now, I want to lean into the imagery of the first parable, but because they both have the same message uh, in, in, a, in a sense, or, or really in essence. So I want to lean into the imagery of the first parable. So I've got to give you a little bit of context, because, you know, if the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, uh, which a man found and covered up, uh, and then goes and sells everything and, and uh, buys that field, uh, we need to understand the context, because in Jesus' day, they didn't have banks. They didn't have safety deposit boxes. They didn't have some place you could go and take your, your valuables and insure them and know that they were secure. Uh, they didn't have homes where you could, uh, you know, have uh, deadbolts and safes and things like that either. Uh, so uh, you had an o- two options. Uh, either you had to build your own treasure room, which to do that you had to be extremely wealthy. Extremely wealthy, because think about it. Uh, You had to have a a house that had a wall around it. You had to have guards. You had to have security. Uh, All of that if you were going to have a treasure room. So most people, that's not an option. Okay? That's for kings. That's for royalty. That's for uh, a few really, really rich people. Uh, So what's your other option? You had to hide your valuables. Well, your house is not really secure. Okay, it it isn't. So you have other people watching and seeing because you live in community, but uh, to really protect your treasure, you had to hide it. So where could you hide it? In the ground. You you had to dig a hole and hide your valuables in the ground. And obviously it couldn't be in an obvious place. It had to be someplace uh, special. So some people would hide their treasure on property they didn't own because nobody would expect it there. Nobody would be looking for it there, right out in the field. And, and sometimes, I don't know about you, but when I hide stuff, I forget. Yeah. <laughs> right? Anybody else ever found a Christmas present like in March that you didn't give to somebody? And you're like, oh, yeah, it's a perfect present. I just forgot that I had it. See, we forget where we hide stuff because we hide it so good. And so, so sometimes people would hide things out in the field and they would forget which field. Where it was. They'd forget maybe that they had it because maybe they had two or three places that they'd stash stuff. Or maybe you go hide it in a field and uh, then, you know, you don't tell anyone where it is because you don't trust anyone and then something happens to you. You die and your heirs don't know where you hid the treasure. So uh, here's what happens. You're out there working in a field. Maybe you're walking through a field and you stumble into some treasure. You come across some while you're digging that treasure. And here's the way the law applied in that day. If you uncovered the treasure, pulled it out of the ground, it belonged to the owner of that field. Okay? It, it was the owners of the field. So if you and some other workers found it and you unearthed it, you had to go give it to the owner. Okay? Otherwise, you're breaking the law. And, and by the way, again, did I mention you live in community? Everybody's poor. So if suddenly you've got a bunch of money, everybody's going to know you got a bunch of money. Okay? But if you didn't unearth that treasure, you stumbled across it, you, you hit that, that chest with that, that shovel or something, and you went, oh, there's treasure here. And then you went and bought that field. That treasure's yours. It's yours. That's the context of the story. It, it's, it's Jesus telling something that's entirely plausible to the people who are listening. Because most of them are working poor. Most of them are working out in fields. And it's their dream to one day come across some treasure and do exactly what Jesus said. Because then I get rich. Then I have something. Then somebody mails me the lottery, winning lottery ticket. Right? See, that it, it, it's kind of one of those dreams. And Jesus says this person finds it. And what do they do? They go and sell everything they have. Why do they sell everything they have? Because they got to get the money to buy the field. And when they get the money to buy the field, it doesn't matter if they have anything else because now they have the treasure. So that's the setting. That's the background. So the first thing we need to see from this is whether I am seeking or stumbling, 
the greatest treasure can be mine. Whether I'm seeking or stumbling, the greatest treasure can be mine. See, what is that great treasure? It's the kingdom of heaven. It's eternal life. It's coming to the realization that Jesus died to pay for my sin. That he was raised from the dead. And if I follow Jesus, I get heaven instead of what I deserve. That I get eternal life instead of eternal punishment. That I get to become one of God's children. This is the greatest treasure. Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. So how did you find the treasure? How did you find the treasure? By the way, I hope this is a question that you ask each other when, when uh, you go to dinner or lunch after the services. That this is a question I hope that in your life groups, you look at the other members of your life group and you say, so how did you find the treasure? Because some of you found the treasure when you were looking for it. You know, you were saying, I want to know the truth and I want to find the truth. And, and you were intentionally checking out churches and you were going and visiting and you were listening and you were reading the Bible and you said, I need to know the truth. And, and since Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, I know that if you seek the truth, you're going to find Jesus. Which, by the way, is why we love questions here at Calvary. If you've got honest questions about faith, about life, about the world, about how it works, then we invite you to ask us. We're not afraid of the questions. We want to share with you what we've learned, what we, what we understand the Scripture to teach. Because we know that if you're seeking, you're going to find God. Right? God said, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. So some of you, you were looking for truth. You said, there's got to be more. I want to know. And you found the treasure. You found that relationship with Jesus Christ. And some of you fell into the treasure. Right? You just stumbled into it. You weren't looking for God. You weren't interested in church. You weren't looking to change your life. But you had that friend that's annoying. Right? You had that friend that kept inviting you, kept harassing you, even went to the point of bribing you. And you went with them to church or you went with them to a Christian concert or you went with them to youth camp or a men's retreat or a ladies retreat. And, and while you were there, you know, you know just hum, you know, kind of giving in to your friend, you know, just kind of like humoring them. God showed up and he surprised you and he changed your life and you suddenly found the treasure that you were not expecting, you were not looking for. And some of you were like me. You grew up around the treasure. You heard about it. You saw people living in it. Uh, and, and it was easy for you to discover that the treasure was for you also. And so you embraced the gift of life from Jesus Christ because that was just what was normal. You've been exposed to it your whole life. So how did you find the treasure? And I ask that again because if you can't answer how you find the treasure, then I want to ask the question, have you found the treasure? Because if you haven't found the treasure, if you can't go, hey, yeah, this is how God revealed himself to me. This is, uh, you know, I know that I have a relationship with Jesus Christ that has changed my life. Then I want you to find the treasure. I want you to know that you found the treasure. I want you to come to that place where you understand and believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. That you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead. And you come to that place where you make a commitment to follow Jesus as Lord. You surrender your life to him. You confess him as your master. Because that is the treasure and I want everyone to find it. Now, of course, some of you know about the treasure. But you're afraid to commit to Jesus. Because you know that if you commit to Jesus, he's going to change your life. That he's going to ask you to give up something. Maybe it's some habits that you have, are fond of. Maybe it's some values that he's going to try and change that you kind of like. Maybe it's some patterns of destruction. Maybe it's just the fact that you know he's going to ask you for some money or time and service. And that brings us to the moral of the story. The moral of the story is no price is too steep to pay. No price is too steep to pay for the kingdom of heaven, for eternal life, for God. See, in the story, what did the man do? He found the treasure in the field, and then what did he do? 
He sold everything. Guy found the pearl he was looking for. What did he do? He sold everything. All of it. So that he could have what he valued, what he'd been looking for, what he wanted. You know what that looks like? Here's, here's what it looks like. This is a simple way of summarizing it. Uh, would you give me $5 if I offered you $100? Okay, some of you are like, I don't know. What's, what's the catch? No, if I just had $100 and I said I'll trade you $100 for $5, is there anybody in this room that wouldn't take that deal? See, so, you know, you would take the deal. You'd go, well, yeah, are you that dumb? Okay. Or maybe I'm just that gracious. You see, that's what this is like. You sacrifice the $5 to gain $100. Is that a loss? In any way, shape, or form, is that a loss? No, because you gained a whole lot more than you gave up. So that's not really a sacrifice. And, and that's what Jesus is offering. That's what this is all about. Sell everything. What does that mean? That means that we bring our broken, hurting, self-destructive, rebellious selves to God. It's really not even $5 worth, folks. Let's just be honest. When we bring ourselves the way that we are to God, it's really more like a bag full of dog poop, okay? We're just doing, here we are, we're a mess, we stink, okay? And God gives us life. He, you know, we give Jesus our mess and he provides forgiveness and redemption and heaven and adopts us as, as his brothers and sisters so that we get to share in all of his riches. It is a crazy exchange. But I don't want to give up stuff that I really like. See, here's the catch. Okay, this is the hard part. The guy sold everything he had so he could get that field. You have to go all in with Jesus. You have to go all in with Jesus. He wants your whole self. He wants your whole life. Let, let me just be really blunt. There is no such thing as a trial-sized Savior. Okay? Doesn't exist. I will try this Jesus out for a little while and see if it works. That is not going to work. There are no bargain believers. There are no discount disciples. Okay? It costs you everything. And, and by the way, this is really hard for me to hear because I am cheap to the core. Okay? I am so cheap that I'm always looking for the deal that I will even order a special in a restaurant that I don't want because it's a better deal. Anyone with me on that? Okay. See? It's terrible. He goes, is that really what you wanted? No, but it was a good deal. Right? That's pathetic. And yet that doesn't work when it comes to Jesus. He just, he wants all of us. See, following Jesus costs you everything. That whole bag of dog poop. So that you get everything. You get life. You get all the goodness of God. And, and he's worth it. He wants us to go all in. Um, now, here's the tension. For a lot of us in this room who are, who are followers of Jesus Christ, here is the tension point. Because um, some of us have sold everything. We bought the field. But we never unearthed the treasure. In other words, we're technically rich because we're children of the king. We own the field with the treasure in it, but we're living like Poppers. Spiritually, we're not living in the reality that we've inherited. We're living as poor people when we're sitting on a bunch of buried treasure. In other words, you, you heard the gospel. You believed in, in what we, we've taught and, and you've committed to follow Jesus. But you haven't realized the riches of the kingdom. You're still camping on a barren field with buried gold. Why is that? Because you're not going all in every day with Jesus. You're not surrendering daily to your Savior. 
and you're trying to do it yourself and you're trying to live on your resources, even though you spent everything to buy the field, it's just a barren field until you unearth the treasure. And, and, uh, and you're just, you're not going all in for the kingdom. And, and, and I don't know how that looks in your life. Maybe you're trying to bargain with God. Maybe you're trying to say, hey, God, if you do this, then I'll do that. Uh, and, and, or maybe you're negotiating for a better deal. There is no better deal, by the way. Grace is good enough. But you're, you're, you're in that place where you're trying to, to you know, work God to get a, a, a deal on something. Or maybe you're just trying to hold on to some of those old things that you were supposed to sell. But to realize the treasure... To enjoy its impact in your life, you have to let go of all you have so that you can take hold of the kingdom with all that you are. you got to let go of that stuff you've been holding on to that you used to have so you can take hold of Jesus fully. Because we want more of him. More of him. In other words, you got to give up the $5 in order to get the 100. And some of you are still holding on to the five. Like, ah, I don't know if this is a good deal. And you're missing out on the joy. You're missing out on the, the life that God wants to pour out on you. And, and, and maybe you're sitting here right now asking yourself, am I going all in or not? Have I let go of the old things or not? And, and here's a test. And it's, and it's a crazy test. It's a simple test. Uh, but here's the test. Am I still excited about forgiveness? Am I still excited about forgiveness? Now, if, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, do you remember when you first discovered the treasure? When you first tasted God's amazing grace? When, when you you know, first realized that you were forgiven and you were just thrilled by that and you were energized by the reality that you get heaven even though you deserve hell. Isn't that a great place? And it's all new and it's all fresh and you're just like, oh, this is so cool. This is so great. This is so awesome. So are you still excited about forgiveness? Are you still in awe of mercy? Are you still, you know, just in wonder at God's amazing grace? Or... Have you taken it for granted? Has it kind of gotten a little bit stale? By the way, it becomes stale if you're camping out on a barren field on top of buried treasure. Because you're frustrated a lot. And you're wondering why it's not as good as you thought it would be. I grew up in churches. I knew a whole lot of Christians who spoke about grace, who sang songs about redemption. You know, amazing grace. We sang it all the time. Just as I am, we sang it all the time. Uh, and then, of course, they preached about forgiveness. They talked about forgiveness. Everybody was, you know, yeah, you know, forgiveness and, and Jesus is my Savior. But here's the thing. There wasn't a lot of joy. Just wasn't. In fact, honestly, in some places... Joy was frowned upon as being immature, which when you read the Bible is kind of crazy because it's like joy's on every page. I mean, God tells us to rejoice so many times that I don't know how you can miss it. Maybe because we're so good at missing it, right? I mean, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it because you're idiots. Rejoice. Oh, I'm sorry. I added that a little bit. Paul didn't write that in. I think he was thinking it though. Right? I mean, because we get so serious, we get so fixated on our problems that we forget to rejoice. I mean, Jesus said, I've taught you these things so that, you know, my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. He completely wants us to have joy. It doesn't matter if we're facing trials or, or for celebrating, right? Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, James says. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result that you might be mature. And complete, lacking nothing. It, you know, there's, it, we're just supposed to rejoice. <laughs> and I, I grew up around a lot of people that talked about grace, talked about mercy, talked about forgiveness, sang about it. But there wasn't a lot of joy. 
There wasn't excitement about the mission. There wasn't a lot of enthusiasm about serving. In fact, you know, if we're being honest, there wasn't enthusiasm about much of anything. I mean, I'm not even talking muted enthusiasm. I'm talking funeral home type thrills. And I know some great funeral directors, so I feel like I have to apologize for that because they got a lot more excitement than some of the churches I was in. See, if you didn't grow up in church, you're sitting there going, really, seriously? And I'm here to tell you, yes. It's possible for it to happen because we get stale in our faith. We let it kind of atrophy. And that's because we're not in touch with grace. And I think we're not in touch with grace because we're not going all in for Jesus. And so that treasure just lies there unrealized. And I hate the fact that, that we're technically rich and yet we're living as paupers. So, the treasure is priceless, whether I live like it or not. Okay? That, that's reality. The treasure is the treasure, whether I'm living like it or not. And, and the reality that because of Jesus, I get heaven when I deserve hell, that reality, that, by the way, that's the reality of grace. If you're going, whoa, I don't really understand the grace. The, the reality of grace is that I get heaven when I wholeheartedly deserve hell. That should never become stale. That should never get old. That should never, you know, become commonplace. We should never take that for granted because that reality is what changed our life and what will change the world. And I don't think the celebration of God's life-changing power should ever become muted. And by the way, if it does, it's about us, not about God. And not about his gift. If it ever becomes stale in your life, it's you. It's not God. And it's not his gift. So have you found the treasure? So have you found the treasure? <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> was it, it never was meant to be rhetorical, so it was kind of like. Do you want to live in God's abundance? Then we got to go all in. And if we're going to go all in, then ask yourself this question. I'm going to ask it of you, but really this is the one you need to ask of yourself. Who will I joyfully tell about the treasure I found? Who will I joyfully tell about the treasure that I found? See, and, and, and I love that. Someone over here said everyone. And I love that attitude, but I want you to be a lot more specific than that. Because see, here, here again, the churches I grew up in, we love everyone, which translated to, we actually show love to no one. Because I can't just love everyone, but I can love you. And you. And, and you. And see, that's just it. But it's got to be personal, because if it's not personal, it never happens. And we got to take this personally. And, and see, notice there's two things here. First of all, who will I joyfully tell? See, because some, again, I've seen people go, hey, you wouldn't want to go to church with me, would you? <laughs> hey, pastor, I invited them. They just wouldn't come. That, that is not joyful telling. Hey, the church said I have to invite somebody to church, and you're somebody, well, you want to come? come? You know, you know uh, by the way, if, if you're just a, a grouch, no one's going to come with you to church anyway. Because they're going to be like, oh, well, if you're representative of the people. So we've got to get in touch with the joy. Again, this is where live, you know, living in the riches that God intends for us, it, it shows up on your face. It shows up in your life. And, and so who are you joyfully going to tell? And then, and then it needs to be really specific. Okay, last week, I, and if you weren't here last week, then I'll, I'll catch you up. Okay, I shared about this crazy vision that, that I have that in, in Havasu and in Parker, we're going to reach 10% of the unchurched people in our communities. Okay, 10%. That means, you know, 4,000 people in Havasu, 500 to 1,000 people in Parker, depending on which statistics you, you read. And, and, and here's the thing. The only way it's going to happen is if we joyfully tell people about the treasure that we found. That's it. Because here's the thing. 4,500 people coming to faith over the next eight years is, is, um, is insane in church world. 
It's nothing in God's economy. He's like, I did that in a day. <laughs> like the first day. Eh, you guys are not impressive. Because I started off with like 40 people and you've already got 2,000. So this should be like a piece of cake for you guys. And see, that's just it. It, it, it. It's a crazy goal, but it's not a crazy goal when you look at this from God's perspective. And then when you do the math and just simply go, hey guys, you know what that means? That means that for each one of us, we need to influence two people to come to that place of faith in Jesus Christ. Two people, each. If we each commit to leading two people in the next eight years to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, which we ought to be doing anyway, but if we say, hey, I'm going to be part of this, and I'm going to be part of this mission, and then here's the question. Who are you praying for? Who are you inviting? Who are you encouraging? Because if you don't have a name and a face and say, I'm going to be uh, praying for them, and I'm going to be looking for opportunities to invite them, and by the way, you've got to have more than two names because none of us bat a thousand. So you probably have to have at least four names, and, and you know, even 500 is like all-star level. So uh, I'm just saying you've got to be intentional about this, but the only way it's going to happen is if you're all in for the kingdom. And if you're all in for the kingdom, you're going to experience the joy of Christ, and that joy is going to overflow as you tell other people, as you invite other people, as you bring other people. Now here's the, here's the closing comment that I have. The best thing about the treasure of the kingdom. You ready for this? It only grows when you give it away. It only grows when you give it away. You keep it to yourself and it actually gets smaller. But when you give it away, it grows. So, Let's give it away. Let's give it all away and see what God does because we're all in for his kingdom. Will you pray with me? Father, your grace is amazing. Your love is incredible and we do want to know you more. So reveal yourselves to us. And God, speak truth into our lives. We invite your Holy Spirit to, to convict us, to show us the truth about the treasure in our lives, to show us the truth about how we're holding back. And God, give us the courage to go all in. Because you're still wanting to change us and develop us and turn us into the sons and daughters of God that you've called us to be, that you created us to be, that Jesus died to make us. And so we first give you ourselves fully. And then we ask that you would use us to transform our communities in the name of Jesus Christ. That's our prayer. God, you're the only one who can make it a reality. So we invite you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.